Stephen King's on writing. Yeah, yeah. No one finishes that book. <laughs> oh, I've read that read? book like three times. All right, welcome to the Scripted Podcast, uh, our first episode in uh, 2021. Welcome yes. back, John. Welcome back, Kevin. Um, a bit of a hiatus, but uh, we're glad to be back. And uh, Indeed. You know, at the beginning of spring, we thought we'd have a little bit of a rebirth in a new season <laughs> of uh, <laughs> the Scripted Podcast. Yes, we are finally reborn. Yeah. We should probably open this up with previously on Scripted. Yeah, yeah, everyone's going to be so lost. Uh, so what are we talking about today? Kevin, today we're going to be talking about editors. And we'll be joined by two veteran scripted editors, Rachel McCauley and Matthew Thompson. Um, and we'll be chatting a bit about their history as editors, um, their careers, and uh, also a little bit about you know how writers can avoid having their content sent back to them by editors for revisions. Um, and we'll also be talking about those relationships with writers. Yeah, I'm excited to hear what they have to say about that often contentious relationship um, between writers and editors. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's weird, right? I think um, a lot of that comes from writers having an attachment to their work and uh, sort of viewing editors as attacking um, this thing that's personal to them. But I, I, I'm hoping that we can kind of humanize editors a bit with this episode. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I hope uh, our, our writers who are listening realize that our, our editors are there to help improve their skill set. And uh, and I'm sure that's what we'll find out yep. in our discussion today. Editors are not your enemy. Let's do it. Matt and Rachel, welcome to the show. Hi. Hey there. Good to be here. Yeah. Great to have you. So, yeah, let's just jump right in. Um, why don't you guys tell us a little bit about how you got your start as editors? Got my start as an editor with Scripted or got my start as an editor in life? Sure, we'll go with in life. Okay. Uh, as if anyone read the, read the newsletter will know, I started out <laughs> right from college. I, I was one of those starstruck, live near the city, going to go into fiction publishing. Mm -hmm. um, and the problem at the time was that the really good fiction houses were paying, no exaggeration, this was early 90s, $13,000 a year. Ooh. And I was commuting from my parents' home in Central Jersey, so I went with John Wiley and Sons, which was published uh, paying a huge twenty-one and a half thousand dollars a year. <laughs> Yippee! Um, but I got dead ended in chemical encyclopedias, Kirk Othmer chemical encyclopedias, and as a girl who hated science, especially chemistry, it was not an optimal situation. Yeah. So yeah, oh, I eventually man. started freelancing, but. I do have that experience in chemical encyclopedias. <laughs> Which we all have our own copy of. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, you know, obviously, I don't, I assume it's not around anymore. I mean, obviously, John Wiley and Sons is they do the how to dummies guides, right. um, you know, whatever for dummies. But sure. uh, and they're, they're a great, great company. But I just ended up in a dead end apartment. Yeah. Well, that's tough. If the Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, craze comes back from the 90s. You still got that. <laughs> and how about you, Matt? Uh, I did a lot of, like, uh, I, I went to University of Kentucky, which is one of the few um, colleges that has a daily student-run newspaper. So I did a lot of editing there. And when I got out of school, I um, didn't really find uh, there, there were basically no jobs. It was the beginning of the recession. Right. And uh, a friend of mine worked for a company that did a ridiculous thing that should make no money. And they have since gone out of business for very good reasons. But they, <laughs> g <laughs> but they gave me a title of research editor. And whole, having a good title can open so many doors <laughs> sure sure so like once i got to the point with them where like they weren't giving raises but health insurance costs went up every year so effectively i was making less money the longer i worked there i was just like i'm out and started <laughs> freelancing and just having the word editor confirmed on your on your resume would get people to be like yeah we'll try you awesome 
It's crazy because I went in as an editor, and I also was an editor at my at Rutgers um, on the Daily Targum. But uh, I went in as an editor, and uh, I'm sorry, as an editor, yes, editorial assistant at an analyst firm in New Jersey. I'm not going to name it. It was great though. But one day they decided they were going to make me into an analyst because they needed one. <laughs> and at the time, it was voice and wireless technology, very cutting edge stuff in the late '90s. Of course. Um, I was in the first like cars out in San Jose being driven around with all the paraphernalia on top for drive, drive you know, turn by turn directions. Sure, sure. So it was oh, really wow. crazy fun, but it was the most bizarre experience because I had no experience as an analyst. And they literally promoted me one day and threw me to the city to a client the next day. <laughs> and I'm just like, I'm an editorial assistant. <laughs> so um, I had three and three and a half years as a voice and wireless analyst, and uh, it was really cool. But it's am amazing how titles can just waylay you in all different directions. Yeah, yeah. another another extremely specific category of editing. <laughs> the weird thing about the editing that I was doing for this this company, they did like market media impressions. And mm. they would record video from new segments and provide transcripts. I was literally editing closed captioning transcripts. <laughs> wow. I, so you're the one we're responsible that's, for. Yeah, that, <laughs> no, 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 no. no, no. I wish. I wish I was responsible <laughs> for what you saw on the TV. I was responsible for turning that crap into something that a client could read. <laughs> right. Did right. uh, you ever throw your shoe at the TV now? Like, hey. <laughs> do you guys do you guys watch TV with the closed captioning on? Uh, my husband needs it because otherwise do. the volume would be up too high. It drives yeah. me crazy because you know what's coming. I have it on twenty four seven. I always have closed captioning on. Yeah, uh, I actually have before. two. Yeah. yeah, and I have a theory that that listening comprehension i think in like the millennial generation and younger is going to be decreasing in the next 10 years because of it because yeah i feel like i need it now yeah and, it's, uh, it's fantastic you pick up so much more on like a television show or a movie like when you have the closed captioning on like the background noise like any of the whispers between characters that you wouldn't pick up sure. normally you get all yeah. of that audio and you're like oh well, there's no way i was going to hear any of that before uh, yeah. No, but it makes you wonder if we're all just becoming uh, less grammatically correct then because we're reading the closed captioning <laughs> that Matt yes. so correctly called crap. No. Um, <laughs> because it's never spelled right and it's actually laughable. Yeah, right. a lot of it is pretty bad. That's true. It's, uh, it's not laughable or inaccurate. you do it for eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing that'll stand out to you is anytime a horse is on TV. <laughs> <laughs> because you see the little caption horse whinnies right. horse whinnies. <laughs> horse <Aww. comes> <laughs> or, or like uh someone walking into a club and then indistinct rap song yeah yeah <laughs> i love like, the oh, music okay. views it's like yep, upbeat yep. music <laughs> sad yep, yep, pensive yep. music yeah i do like stuff like that when i'm watching foreign films that's it's pretty great Yo, totally. I, I will also turn on closed captioning sometimes while I'm watching something that's British because I have no idea what those people are saying. <laughs> same, same. Yeah, same, my wife's same. the same. She, we, she. Anytime we have a, a British show on, she's like, "Is the closed captioning on? I can't understand a word of this." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so let me ask you then. You know, obviously we're kind of almost touching on the answer of this now, but why? And this is a very general question, but but also kind of far reaching. Why do you think editing is important? I oh, I was gonna say I was letting Matt go first. Go ahead. Yeah, Matt. yeah. <laughs> I I think that as is being as is clear from from my my stuttering right now, like hmm. the human communication isn't very well planned. Like when right. we're talking, our brains are processing things, and we're trying to turn like thoughts and feelings into something that another person can understand. And writing is like the only real thing that I can think of as as genuinely planned communication right and um the problem the only problem that happens is that no matter how well the writer plans you're in your own head right and so you can i mean this happens to me all the time i write something read it looks great give it to somebody else and and, and they can find 20 things wrong with it right so you, I think editing is important because 
it adds a it, it adds an extra layer to the planning of effective communication by inserting someone else's intelligence into what the original copy was. Right, right, right. It's interesting because I guess I have a similar answer um, in the sense that it's focused, right? So we're not just, right now, we're just kind of shooting the breeze and rambling, but you don't want that in a document. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to read stream <laughs> right. of consciousness, right? Um, especially in a business document, right? Yeah. So you need an editor to come in and say, you know what, you've used that word about 10 times in the paragraph. Um, we need to make it sound better. We need to make it sound focused. We need it to be cohesive and we need it to have a point. Right. And um, to tag again onto what Matt said, one of the reasons I tend to edit more than write these days, because I'm a self-editing writer mm. and that just sucks. Like yeah. you, you can't write at a great volume or speed because you're constantly questioning your word use. Right. Um, you're checking yourself and it just is, it's painful. Um, so I've kind of gone back and I like a position as a second set of eyes instead of a first set of eyes. That's interesting. Yeah, like nothing comes out like uh, an Aaron Sorkin character where everyone oh seems my God, to be the rambling. super knowledgeable and like ready <laughs> with a quip, right? Nothing comes out that way in the first draft. Um, it needs to be worked on um, yeah. and researched, you know? Right. Nobody's that brilliant from mm. the start. <laughs> exactly. Do you, no. think that there's an, do you think that there's an ending ever? Like one thing we talk about internally and, and you know, and part of the reason that we've had editing in various different ways on, on scripted through the years. But one thing that we've always felt is that there isn't really a piece um, that doesn't need editing. Uh, do you think that that that's true? Do you think that there's like a, a point where a, a piece can be edited essentially endlessly? And where do you draw the line? Sure. I think that you can, if you don't pay attention to a client's guidelines, you can choose to edit it ad nauseum just because you don't agree or don't particularly like the way it's going. Right. Um, but I think having those guidelines as your framework makes it so there's an ending, a concrete, you know, okay, you've finessed the writer's words, you think that you've met the client's requirements, send it on, you know, it's merry way. Right. If there weren't, if there weren't for deadlines, nothing would be finished. Yeah. For sure. That's, for sure. I, yeah, I, I, is that what it is then? Is it the yeah. deadline essentially? Like, is that <laughs> when you know that the paint is finished essentially? It's a hard call because, for instance, I used to edit for a poetry journal. Mm. And, you know, and what is poetry and how do you edit it? Right. Yeah. Um, and it was really like very lightly touched. So mm. it was a Chicago manual of style, uh, style guide. And the only thing I really did was make sure it was consistent, um, which is hard to explain in poetry. And then just kind of question the order of certain words or particular use of a word um, and really make sure if something was capitalized in one place, they capitalized it somewhere else. Like it was, and make sure the references were correct. Right. You know, yes. if they're talking about Oz Ozymandias or, you know, um, yeah. it didn't happen in like Tacoma. <laughs> right, 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 right. But it was a really different experience than editing white papers because. God. Yeah. You know, like poetry, you can really, really make a argument for anything. Right. I mean, imagine editing E.E. E. Cummings back in the day. Exactly. Yeah. It's got to be, it's, it's day and night to something where it's, where you can kind of objectively edit. Um, yeah. That's how I've always wondered is, you know, I guess without the presence of deadlines, I, I assume a piece can just be edited infinitely. I think that that's true of creative writing like you could edit right. something forever and i i think that i have been editing something forever or at least two decades right <laughs> um <laughs> when it comes to um most of the projects that come through scripted i think there is a point where you go well, that's good right could you edit it to death sure mm -hmm. but like it's your objective yeah. and a business goal behind it Eventually, you're going to have a best practice that meets its, like, you know, standard. Yeah. I think also, eventually, you're going to hit up against the client who says, no, that's not what I had in mind at all. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Or, right. yeah, this is perfect. 
right. Well, one hundred percent. If if I were to be overly focused on grammar for some clients, I think that they would turn around and say, "What is this?" Right. Mm-hmm. Like I don't know what this means, and I'm like, "Oh, you guys spent so much time making this perfectly clear." And they're like, <laughs> and, "And they're like, sure, but but realistically, my clients read at fourth grade levels." And, right. And that's something to think about is like if you something that's pretty new, at least for me over the past few years, is is using applications to assist the editing. And so like you like you use like the Hemingway app and it's like fourth right. grade. That's good for some people. Right. It's terrible for some other people. Like you don't want it. Mm-hmm. But if you plug it in, you get like 16. Nobody wants it. No one wants graduate school writing. It's terrible. Yeah. Right. No, no, yeah. It is difficult and painful, I think, yes. <laughs> yeah. the era that we're in. So, yeah, I want to talk specifically about uh, your work on Scripted. Both of you have been longtime editors on the platform. Uh, when did you guys both start? I started about five years ago, I think is what I figured out um, mm. when we were talking prior to this. Uh, I started out as a writer, and within a few months, Scripted approached me and asked me to try out as an editor. Um, I, so it was pretty shortly after that. So it's about five years. I think I've been wow. doing it for about seven. And then there was like an editing, there was an editing Lull. side for a while, and then it disappeared yep. for a while, and then it came back. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so like a lot of the content that you're going to see on the platform is business related right. content, uh, content marketing purposes. A lot of the time you guys edited a majority blog post, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about like the different, different approaches you take when you're, when you're editing something for SEO or business, um, rather than just a purely grammatical, um, editing, uh, process, like what are the differences really? And how much do you, Think about the writer and the the customer during that process. I try to put myself in that person's frame of mind. Um, mm. I think that there's a certain level of uh, of writing and also editing that that shares a commonality with acting, where you have to put your, where you have to put yourself in like you're pretending to be someone that you're not. Like okay, like I do not care about cars. Don't care at all. Right. Well, this blog is about how how awesome cars are. So now I'm reading this thing and pretending I care about cars. It's I can only do it well if I can like really put myself in the position of somebody who is going to read this. Interesting, right, Rachel? I don't disagree with that. I think that um, you know, I used to say when you're a writer, you're a you're a subject matter expert for like the blink of an eye, right? Right. Um, I've been a subject matter expert in so many things that right now if you like i look back at my writing from six or seven years ago i'd say wow i I forgot i even knew that you know like some of us have had to learn like all about cbd oil for you know five days while we write things and um so when you're an editor um and again i'm gonna agree with matt it's like you're well you obviously have to put yourself in the driving seat Mm-hmm. Um, and be and read it from a consumer um, with the additional task of you have to make sure that the writer, especially if it's SEO, right, you're hitting your keywords without being obvious about it, which yeah. mm-hmm. does get hard. And I've had writers, some really good scripted writers push back on me when I'm just like, um, the client wanted this keyword in there or these five keywords in there. And they're like, you know, we've been talking about keyword stuffing for decades now, right? It doesn't yeah. work. Right. And they'll be like, oh, I don't think that's going to work. And I'm just like, and this kind of goes with the last question. You know what? We're going to push it through and see if the client agrees. Because at the end of the day, we're really just the intermediary between the two. Right, yeah. which is unique yeah, to freelance writing, right? That you have two clients, essentially. Or that you have to, yeah. You have to work with the writer and the client. You're basically a representative of the client to the writer, like a buffer almost. Well, and... We also represent scripted. So mm, right. it's really, really interesting because we kind of are looking at three people, right? In this case, yeah. 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 Um, and that's why I think at the end of the day, and I'm, I might be wandering off topic, it's like you can't have an ego 
if the mm. client's like, you know, the writer didn't really get this, maybe the editor should have caught that or that the writer's like, you know what, I don't think that's right. At the end of the day, which, by the way, is an expression I hate. So sorry, I, use that. I hate that expression. <laughs> Me too. Oh, um, God. You, you pass it through and hope that you did your best. You'll see it again if you didn't, or you'll see it in the messaging. But um, right. yeah, I've wandered as far off that topic. So no, sorry. no, no. I think no, that's, that's interesting. Relevant. Yeah, for sure. And, and, and to touch back, too, on what you guys were talking about as far as playing these roles, I, I've always been curious about that. Um, have you ever encountered a topic that required too deep of a dive to sort of put yourself into that mindset? I still don't understand cryptocurrency. Okay. <laughs> oh, don't worry. Nobody does. That's <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 That's understandable. You know, I've tried for years. I've read you guys. There have been stellar writers on scripted writing these great pieces. Um, and I've tried to use it as a writing, a uh, learning opportunity too. And I still, still don't get it, but not for lack of wanting yeah. to. I've had, I've had John explain it to me like five times and I still <laughs> it's, Yeah, it's, I, I'm in that game and, and there's still a ton I don't actually understand. And some of it actually is beyond understanding. There's not. And really I think that's really it, right? Yeah, so no, um, it is. My, my son's a bio um, biomedical engineer freshman this year, and he was just home this week and he was trying to explain to me about like dimensions and 10 dimensions and how to represent them. And I think cryptocurrency is like that. You, just, <laughs> you, can't, you picture can't picture a certain. It. Yeah. Well, when you consider that like people are literally building servers that are intentionally designed just to solve math problems that don't mean anything except unlocking currency right right yeah, right no, i i don't think that you can understand it yeah i think i think whenever money is involved um despite the technology it becomes kind of emotion driven um but moving on let me ask you this so where do you think that the adversarial relationship or the perceived adversarial relationship between writers and editors comes from and how do you feel about that I think it actually depends on the writer. Mm. I, I don't I, personally feel that way. In what way do you mean? I, I, I don't feel like, unless somebody asked me to edit something and I thought that their suggestions were just absolutely absurd, which does right. happen. Like I- So you're talking from a writer perspective, you don't yeah, yeah, feel like yeah. you're, okay. Of course. No, it, well, it's completely not personal to me. But and I think that's where the ego comes in. Right. Because there are people out there who think that they're, I'm trying not to curse, but their writes, their writing's the shit, right? So they're, <laughs> right. they're like, and so it, it hits their ego to have any type of correction. Right. So how do you, how have you learned basically to deal with that potential ego problem? Like, is there an approach when you submit uh, editorial requests that you know kind of softens a blow for a certain writer um, that you know is particularly sensitive? I actually try not to look at the names of writers before I read their work. Yeah, that's a good tactic. Oh, so everyone's wow. kind of the same. I do the yeah. opposite. <laughs> really? <laughs> okay, all right. I just, I, I know that I will form either a positive or negative bias for someone. And I, I'm trying really hard not to do that. Interesting. But, um, so I don't do it based on a personal, right? Like, w what do I think this person will respond to? Which I don't know, maybe I should, but I, I do find that sometimes instead of just giving a list of things that they need to fix, it's, I usually ask questions. Like, right. That's don't you gross. think this would be better if we use the, if we use the bullet list here? Right, right, right. And Rachel, you think having a background on the writer is actually improves your Well, and I don't it. use it negatively. So oh, sometimes when I pick up a job, because we don't obviously see the writer beforehand, um, and I see the name attached, I have an expectation for the quality um, being good. So yeah, it isn't. it doesn't have negative connotations. I have certain expectations for some writers who have proven to be stellar in the past. Um, and as far as some writers who I know haven't, done as good a job you know you i agree with matt like our job is to help them get better to a point i mean if you can't write you can't write and you shouldn't be a scripted writer um but if it's just so there was someone and I'm, 
<laughs> if they're listening to this later on, I'm not aiming this at them as being a bad writer at all. But there was someone recently who had the same, made the same point twice in a piece and they were, you know, it was a bullet up top and then it was a subhead in the middle. And I said, and I said, you know, you've done this twice. I highlighted both and I said, you should take one out, but it's up to you to decide which, where to remove it because it might have, it might be more important in one place than another. And that writer, when they sent it back, thanked me for giving them that option, you know, to really just have the flexibility to, to make the decision on their own and for me not to really decide what the slant of the piece was that direction. See, that's interesting. I think you guys are really cognizant of the fact that writing is emotional for writers. So it becomes really easy to offend. Well, we're both yeah. writers. I think right. the worst editors don't come from a writing background. Yeah. Right, right. It's like, you know, when teachers don't have a subject background, you know, they just are like, oh, I'm going to try teaching one day. Mm -hmm. Editors really need to have come up from the ranks to understand how they want to be approached. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. To approach writers that way, because uh, again, it's very ego. You are attached to your words. <laughs> your yeah. words are like you, you birth them. So for someone to, <laughs> I'm the only <laughs> woman here, but to insult your children, <laughs> You know, you're, someone's insulting your children is basically what it is if you get too attached to it. And so as a writer, we just have to be cognizant. Like, we're not saying your kid's ugly. Right. You just need but braces. perhaps if you didn't cut their hair with a bowl. Right, 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 right. right, right. right. Exactly. <laughs> Definitely. So let's get into the nitty gritty here. What kind of mistakes are editors encountering out there on the platform? Hey, that's <laughs> really hard. I, I always want to preface this by saying... Editing is an anal, anal thing, right? Of like course, you have to get course. it really down is. and you have to be, right, Matt? You have to be cognizant of the fact that we know it's anal, but this is our job. So does editing like leak into your everyday life? I mean, there are obvious, there are some obvious things um, like going to the grocery store and, and looking at the, uh, the side and thinking that should be fewer. <laughs> 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 right. I mean, like, again, the word persnickety comes to mind. Right, right. <laughs> but, That's hilarious. I've actually never but, uh, thought about yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, that happens constantly. <laughs> yes. and, 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 but, but there's also... Menus? Oh. Uh, oh, yeah. no, yeah, mm -hmm. just forget it. Yeah. Um, but do you think it helps to be a critical person uh, in life? To I don't be an know, editor? but I am. Is there a correlation uh, to that? You know, I definitely am. Yeah. Critical, but also analytical. So I yeah. always, I think it's mm -hmm. almost obvious that I would have ended up as an editor because I've always been analytical. Mm. Um, and it combines my analytical mind with my love of writing. So I, yeah. I mean, sure, if you ask yeah. anyone around me, they'd probably say, yeah, she's critical. But right. I really think it's, it's analytical. Like you just see things a certain yeah. way. Yeah, you might be right about that. So you have to have a, a certain you have to have a certain love for writing and an analytical mind. Would you say those are two of the probably primary traits? Patience. What I think is 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 interesting though is that Patience, like outside of um, the kind of writing that we're doing, where there are correct and incorrect things, right? With and that's how it is with writing. But when it comes to language with speaking, I am not a prescriptive person at all. Interesting. And and I think that people who are like way into prescriptive grammar are just just need to read some linguistics books. Yes. Basically. It mm -hmm. it it really frustrates me. Yeah, if you're if if look, I want you to write well because otherwise you're gonna come across as a dumbass to some people. It's just gonna happen that way. But like if you're just talking to people like and you're correcting someone's speech, that's not that's I don't even think how is that even socially acceptable? It really <laughs> displays more ignorance than it does intelligence or knowledge. So yeah, let's jump into the uh, let's jump into the lightning round here. We're gonna do uh, a couple of questions. Um, I'm gonna start with this one real quick. What's one thing, just one, that you wish more writers did? Read more. Interesting, Rachel. Oh, my mouth is hanging open. I like read more. I mean, I feel like I just, when I said reread, I would have saved that had I known this question was coming. So reread yeah, before submitting. Yeah, yeah, 
Yes. This is a little uh, James Lipton action for you guys. What's your favorite word and your least favorite word? Gloaming. I love the word oh, gloaming. That is a great word. I hate the word oftentimes. Oftentimes. <laughs> oftentimes. And there are lots of scripted writers who use it. Oftentimes, yeah. Oftentimes. Just often, people. Yeah. <laughs> That's fair. Oh. Yeah. The first word that pops to mind is I really love the word onomatopoeia. Oh, yeah. Just the way <laughs> it sounds. Yeah. Yeah, but I can't really imagine seeing it in many, in much writing. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But I I love the way it sounds. Um, I don't know a, ter- a, a word that I really hate. I'm sure there are a lot of them. Um, I, but I'm gonna go with the phrase because it comes to mind first. In order to, it just means to <laughs> people. In order to, just means yep. to. <laughs> Those are very editor answers. Yeah, for your extremely <laughs> editor answers. Yeah. I actually think the scripted platform will um, highlight, you know, will flag that in order to and recommend that it goes it to two. I'm pretty sure it, it if does. If it doesn't, it should. <laughs> I'll make that yeah. change. Yeah. Agreed. <laughs> so what book should all writers read? There's an almost universal answer here, but we, we kind of know what it I was curious to know what the universal answer was, actually. Well, no, I would. I was going to say "On Writing" by Stephen. King. I was just going to say Stephen is... King's "On Writing." Yeah, I, yeah. No one, fi- no one finishes that book. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've read that book like it. three times. <laughs> oh my god! I've read that. I love that book. Um, yeah, Stephen. I wish Stephen King would follow his own advice more. No, <laughs> yeah, no, he, he needs to read. He needs to read his own book. Well, and this is my problem with people like Stephen King and even Diana Gabaldon, with all my Outlander friends will kill me. <laughs> they need editors. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. yeah. I feel that way very right? strongly about Stephen King. Yeah. I mean... If I'm reading, if I'm flipping through 20 pages of fluff because it's not important to the storyline... Yeah, he's a master. You needed an editor, honey. Master <laughs> of chewing scenery. And that's the exactly what... Stephen King advises against do it or promotes in, <laughs> in on, on writing. writing. Like, get rid of this crap. You don't want that crap. Mm-hmm. I it blows my mind that he wrote such a good book about writing. And I used to, when I was a kid, love Stephen King. And I actually read one of his books within the past five years, and I don't think it was terrible, but it was schlocky. Yes, <laughs> it is. It is. His name. I think holds a lot more grandeur than his actual content. At this oh, point. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's written 400 books. <laughs> so. right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's pull it into the old classic battleground here for this next question. I'm going to take a deep breath here. The Oxford comma <laughs> thoughts go. Use it. Use it. Look, always. We're, I, we're, I, always you know, you... we're not using printing presses anymore. People, you can just, there's no reason <laughs> not to use it. Mm-hmm. I was against it just because I had a client who didn't like using it. And I was just like, you know, I, I could see not using it. But then everyone, all my other clients did. And I was just like, no, I really like the way it looks. Let's put it back there. Yeah. It, it makes sense to me. If there, uh, I mean, It doesn't make sense the other way to me. I don't understand the argument at all. Actually. Same, same. I, I, I was actually uh, putting, I got a new bookshelf recently and was putting some books on it. And I ran into a book that I haven't seen in a long time. Um, Eat Shoots and Leaves. <laughs> right? That's the prime and example, isn't it? It really is. Um, and it, I think, like I said, it made sense at one time to not use it. If you have a printing press, and I've used a printing press, putting down each little letter is a pain. If you can take one out, do it. But right. we're, come on, man, we're digital now. It doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> Just use the comma. All right. Well, then, in a similar this this was this is actually maybe one of the more mo- most peaceful discussions about this that I've been part of. Yes. Okay. So one space or two space after a sentence. Uh, one's one. enough. Okay. Yeah. It uh it actually shows your age if <laughs> you're still putting two two spaces after a sentence. You're like that would strike well, me either as you, weird. Yeah. yeah. You're either remembering it from grade school, <laughs> and that's like the last time you thought about it. Or you're just like way older and you didn't think about how it changed over the last 20 years. Where It's kind of, it's kind of incredible if you think about it, that people would still support 
a double space when we're like a text driven society, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So BRB, but oh, let's put two spaces in there. <laughs> right. I, I do have muscle memory though. Whenever I sit down in a real typewriter, it gets double spaced. Oh, yeah. That's fair. Because <laughs> you got to hit both thumbs, right? 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 Yeah. 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 And then finally, semicolons. Oh, I love semicolons, but damn, they're hard to use, and you should use them infrequently. Yeah. See, I'm an M dash girl. Yeah. I like M dashes too. I I feel like they they're very they're similar and they have, um, they share a lot of common ground, but they're different tools. To what use. is it that uh, Vonnegut said about semicolons? Uh, uh, they are transvestite hermaphrodites that serve no purpose except to show people that you went to college. <laughs> Very Vonnegut. Yeah. It is very Vonnegut. Uh, not exactly politically correct for the era. I no. think he probably said that in the 60s. But uh, yeah, I think it does just try to look fancier than it needs to be. There Rewrite are some the occasions where I'm like, oh, yeah, that works. But they're rare. They are, and they're rare. I love it used sparingly, very sparingly. I think there was a writer yesterday that I was uh, editing for Unscripted who used them instead of commas. And I was just what like, I was yeah, no. just about to go into. Here's my advice, which is if you aren't 100% sure where semicolons are used, don't use them. I think that's <laughs> At true. All. Yeah. yeah. In fact, I would say that like with the type of content we work on with Scripted, uh, there's probably no use. If you're using it more than three times in your novel, you should think about that. You're right. <laughs> right. That's right. how sparingly I'm talking. <laughs> and if you're still using them at the end of bulleted lists, it's 2021, folks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah. Bulleted lists are, that's, <laughs> that's where it's at. Finally, uh, do you guys have any thoughts, final thoughts for the editors out there who may feel frustrated with uh, the work that's in front of them right now. What advice do you have for them? Editors or writers? Editors. If you're that frustrated with it, I I feel like the writer needs another chance. So Matt's and, going and, with second chances. And, and with a, with a, an encouraging note that might also offer some hidden criticism. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I feel hypocritical because I did just have a recent one where it came back a second time and still was awful. And I was not as, I didn't sugarcoat my words as much as I would have. Second time right. is different. So yeah, um, be kind, give the writer another chance. I agree with Matt, but you know, it also does no one a favor to let a writer who's not up to snuff through. Mm-mm. Right. Right. I think you can see uh, Matt's Southern hospitality in his approach to editing. <laughs> right. Whereas, whereas Rachel, I'm a Jersey girl. Well, Rachel, oh, John, yeah. and I are used to getting told to our faces mm. by our best friends, which is constantly. weird. Because, <laughs> <laughs> which is a little weird because seriously, Louisville is one of the rudest places I've ever been. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> Well, you guys have incredible patience, and uh, we are just beyond thrilled to have you on the platform. And thank you for all your hard work and and for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you so much. It was great. Do you guys have anything to plug? Can you? Yeah, anything you guys working on? Uh, Nothing that's uh, (laughs) working on? (laughs) Yes. The classic writer reply. good times that was good times um kevin is there anything that sticks out to you about what we just discussed you know it was interesting that uh both of them had different approaches uh to like how they see writers right matthew said that he doesn't look at names Mm -hmm. and rachel thought that it was very important for her to know who she was editing yeah yeah super interesting right I, uh, I was fascinated by that. I don't know um, that either approach is, say, more advantageous than the other, but both are, are valid. Um, yeah, right. Like, do you, do you try to remove your own bias mm-hmm. or do you really try to get to know the writers you're 
your editing right. to better kind of associate yourself with them and improve their writing. I mean, there's a couple schools of thought, I guess. Yeah, you know? totally, totally. I think you see this sometimes with uh, fiction writers um, where authors will work with the same editor for the entirety of their career, um, or they prefer to at least. And the reason for that is usually that by developing this relationship with an editor, the editor understands their style intrinsically um, and the edits will be made with that in mind. Um, so while that's slightly different than the type of writing done on scripted, I still think that underscores the importance of mm -hmm. a relationship with the writer. And from an editor's perspective, it's different editing for freelance writers than it is say uh, like a book author yeah, yeah, where you get to know that person and you get to know their writing and you're dedicated to them and their one writing right for freelance editors. You need to be able to move and adjust to different styles, to different goals, to different clients. Yes. Um, like on a dime. So it, it's probably very important, uh, to be able to disassociate yourself. But mm -hmm. I think in either approach, whether it's Matthew or Rachel's, the key is communication. Absolutely. Um, open communication between the writer and editor. So you're not, as an editor, you're not redlining everything that a right. writer does. And as a writer, that's not, like you said, some anonymous person coming in and just destroying your work. <laughs> They're trying to, right. they're trying to make you better. And the way to, I think, get that across in that relationship is to just communicate just openly and, uh, consistently throughout yeah. the process. Totally. And I think you see this across any type of creative medium. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's a reason why when you're recording a song, it goes to a mixing engineer. And after a mixing engineer, it goes to a mastering engineer. Right. And the reason for that is that having this extra set of ears is invaluable in the process. Mm -hmm. um, anyone who is creative or has produced some form of creative output knows that you uh, get married to that work, you know, and you are sort of blind uh, to any issues that it might have. Um, so I think it's kind of weird that this meme of, you know, oh God, I hate my editor <laughs> among writers occurs in the first place is, is these guys are, they're your friends mm -hmm. and almost more importantly, they're writers themselves. Right. Yeah. The best ones are, um, and yeah, just to keep an open mind, um, when you're you know, on either side of that process, um, and don't take things personally. Yeah. And that's certainly hard to do. Well, that does it for this episode of The Scripted Podcast. Uh, join us next week, and until then... We'll see you next time, and, and try to remember, life isn't scripted, but your content should be.